welcome you, brothers and sisters, to this funeral service for Sister Lucille Hoyer. We're grateful for your being here as you show your love and support to the Hoyer family. We welcome family and friends who traveled from near and far. My name is Bishop Adam Perkins. I've been asked to conduct this meeting. Prior to the service beginning, the family gathered in the Relief Society room to have a family prayer after the viewing. That prayer was offered by Brother Randy Mo, who is Lucille's nephew. We're grateful to Sister Ann Bills for playing the organ and Sister Loretta Anderson for conducting the music. We will begin by singing opening hymn number 219, Because I Have Been Given Much, after which an invitation will be offered by Sister Bridget Hoyer, Lucille's daughter-in-law.
After their song, we'll have a live sketch offered by Sister Robin Hoyer, daughter-in-law. After Sister Hoyer, we'll have a harp solo by Michelle Leon, Lucille's granddaughter, who will play Amazing Grace. After she's concluded, we'll have a speaker, Brother Jeff Hoyer, who's Lucille's son. Then a musical number by the Hoyer men who will perform Brightly Beams Our Father's Mercy, accompanied by Sister Ann Bills. We will have a speaker after that, Brother Mike Hoyer, who's Lucille's son, and we will proceed to that.
After a lifetime of love, faith, and unwavering devotion to her family, our dear mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, aunt, and friend, Norma Lucille Nelson Hoyer, age 87, left us suddenly on September 4th, 2024, at her home in Saratoga Springs, Utah. She was joyfully welcomed to the world on March 31st, 1937, by her dear mother, her father, and her beloved older brother, Len, Andrew Len Nelson, who was four years old in Oakley, Idaho. Eventually, four more cherished girls joined the family, Velta, Loa, Linda, and Lori. Lucille's childhood was marked by the last years of the Great Depression and then World War II with all of the accompanying trials her generation endured. She grew up on a farm in Oakley where even though they were quite poor, they all made the most of what they had, learned the value of hard work and persistence, and most important of all, loved each other immensely. Music, as we've seen, was an enduring thread throughout the fabric of her life. Lucille's mother, Dorothy, made their many farm chores more pleasant by singing songs with them. At the end of her life, Lucille could be found singing those very songs to her great-grandchildren. And as a note I didn't put in the obituary, I found a manila envelope full of typed lyrics to all of those songs. And somewhere on her desk, boys, Lucille wanted to play the piano so much that she drew a keyboard on a piece of cardboard so she could practice. Uh, her sister Linda told me that story. Dorothy bought an old upright piano for $20 and the family spent many, many hours together singing along and dancing. Lucille had a very engineering type mind. She was ahead of her time and was the salutatorian of her high school gradu graduating class in Gooding, Idaho. She then attended Ricks College in Rexburg, Idaho, where she received an associate's degree in accounting, proving to one particular naysayer that women really could be accountants. Surely she was ahead of her time. She really was. And might have even been the first college graduate in her family. She was working in, in customer service at a telephone company, saving money to continue her education. When she met a, in her own words, handsome and charming man, who was there on a temporary assignment changing equipment. She married that man, James Bruce Hoyer, her one true love, theirs was a great love story, in Las Vegas, Nevada on May 17, 1958. They had two sons, Michael James and Jeffrey Bruce. Jim and Lucille raised their family in Southern California, and in later years, they moved several times for Jim's work. They lived in Atlanta, Georgia, Evansville, Indiana, Dallas, Texas, Rupert, Idaho, and they finally settled into retirement in the St. George, Utah. She worked at times for an engineering company. She worked for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in social services. And she handled the administrative side of the company that she and Jim owned called Companion Products Incorporated. It was a mail-order fulfillment company for barbecue accessories. One of Lucille's defining characteristics was her great faith. I'm going to put a personal note in here and tell you that I had only been in the church two years when I married her son. And I'm sure that I terrified her because I didn't know anything about the church. Um, she was a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and she was always, even just days before her death, serving others. I was gone um, and Jeff uh, drove, she drove Jeff around, I think, and delivered little things to various people she felt like needed a thank you from her. And that was the very last thing she did with, for others besides us, which she did every day. She had many callings throughout the years and included primary president when her husband was not a member of the church, state primary president, Relief Society president, family history consultant, and Relief Society pianist. That was her last comment. She and Jim also served a mission together at Cope Fort, Utah, giving tours of the historic site. And I'm sure that was way more fun for Jim than it was for her. However, her favorite calling was as organist in the, in the St. George Temple. 
She faithfully performed that service for at least a decade. We couldn't come up with dates when we talked about it. Her great faith and continuous Christ-like service is an enduring legacy to her family and her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and an example for all of her descendants. After Jim died, she made her home in Saratoga Springs, Utah with her youngest son and his wife. It was a warm and welcoming home, decorated with her family pictures and filled with her handmade quilts. She loved flowers of all kinds. She, she had many, many, many down in St. George. Um, she, in her, in her younger years, I have never seen a garden like she had in Evansville, Indiana. It was amazing. She grew vegetables. She grew everything. She knew all, all of the tricks. Um, she brought hollyhock seeds with her up from St. George and planted them down on the golf course side of our wall, our retaining wall. And if you look out there, they're blooming right now. Lucille often played hymns on the grand piano, and when her sister Linda was visiting, she would sit and listen each night as Linda played, and sometimes she would sing along, because I have been given much as the song that Linda told me that she would always sing. She also made beautiful quilts, sometimes with help from her sisters, Delta and Lori, which she gave as gifts to her descendants and others. And we have many, many, we're going to do a kind of lottery for this afternoon. Lucille's talent for mathematics was reflected in her love of puzzles. She had two tables dedicated to puzzles in her home. She also worked many, many word find puzzles. She loved to sit in her kitchen chair, gazing out at the lake while doing her word puzzles and reading her scriptures and her church magazines. But the thing she loved most was when the great grandbabies would come to visit. Even a short visit gave her so much joy. As she played little games with them, and she sang them those same songs that her mother taught. Lucille is survived by three sisters, Veltimo, Linda Stevenson, and Lori Nelson. Her sons, Michael and Jeffrey, their wives, Bridget and Robin, 11 grandchildren, and 19 great-grandchildren. She is also survived by her sons of the heart, Scott Bryant, his wife Patty, and David Hoyer, who's here with us today, and his wife Cassandra. Their six grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. For a grand total, a 17 grandchildren and 26 great grandchildren. She was preceded in death by her adored husband, her beloved only brother, Len, who died when they were quite young. He was 30 something, so he's been gone a very long time. Her dear mama and much loved stepfather, Harold Avery Peterson, her darling sister, Lola Karan, and many, many other loved ones and friends. How she missed them. <coughs> I'm sure her, her, the reunion was great the other day. I'm sure they were all there. Her family will dearly miss her, but take comfort from knowing that she is reunited with all of the people she so loved. And we also find peace and sure knowledge, sure peace and the sure knowledge that we will see her again. She'll be interred in River, Idaho, beside Jim and her mother. I love you, Mom. And I want to take a minute and, and tell you my favorite thing about her, besides all that she taught me, I wish I'd learned how to make her pie crust, because that woman could make the world's best pie crust.
My mom asked her probably six years ago if she would play better than her funeral. She would be so happy to know that she could be in the hip work. Because that was just announced what, yesterday, I guess, the list of wins coming out. This is what I have written down in here. But if we were to actually list mom's accomplishments in life, the acts of compassion, it would be a scroll that would unroll all the way down this room and out the doorway and all the way down the hallway, and it still wouldn't be enough. You know, who was my mom? Well, she was a woman of unwavering faith. You know, a lot of trials came along when they were young, throughout her life. Even lives that you know look to be blessed in some ways are always challenging in others. Every single challenge that my mom ever faced, she faced it with unwavering faith. She just knew that God was with her and that things would be okay. Now that's something that she passed down to me. I sometimes when things are difficult. Just have this faith that it's going to be okay. I don't know where it comes from, but I guess it comes from my mom. So, I'm a person that likes to feel all the feelings. 
I don't push them aside until the, the sad feelings come and I let them come through, but the happy feelings come with them. And those are the ones I hug and cherish. <laughs> so inside of me are all the happy feelings of my mom. And a little bit of sadness leaks out here a little bit. But that's that's the way I want it to be, because I want to feel all that happiness inside me. My mom had unconditional love for her family. And this was family not only by birth, but by choice. She could not have uh, loved her sons, David and Scott, Eddie, more. She loved them as much as she loved Mike and I, because they were her sons. They were children of her heart, and their children, grandchildren, were her children and grandchildren. Robin and I had the same, and so does Mike, the same privilege of having grandchildren that were absorbed into the family, and we love them dearly just every bit as much as we love anyone, you know, that's, a, that's genetically related to us. It doesn't matter, because family is the people that we choose to love. And Mom had unconditional love for everyone. She dearly loved her mother, her sisters, her brother, and also her, her father, you know, technically stepfather, Colonel Peterson, that married her mother when I was, so I was about eight years old, I think, so that would have been about 1968, so they were married quite a long time. And she loved him dearly, just like her own father, and is sealed to him, in fact, in the temple. She was sealed to, to grandpa and grandma. And so that was a choice that she made. She loved him so much that she wanted to be sealed to him. You know, we don't always get to choose all of the things that we go through in life, but we certainly get to choose the way we respond to them. I have the, the great privilege of knowing that I chose my parents because that was told me in my patriarchal blessing. And so, any time when I was growing up, if I ever had the thought, what did I do to deserve, to, or what did I do to be, deserve to be in this family? Well, I always had the answer to that. Well, I chose. So, this is exactly the family that I wanted to be in. This is exactly the family that I needed. Mom was a woman of service, too, and compassion, just a few days before she passed away, she drove me around the neighborhood. I wanted to see how her driving was, so I said, why don't you drive and I'll run the little things up to the door. We delivered a few gifts from her to people that had done her kindnesses. And uh, her driving was better than I had anticipated. Her parking, well, maybe it, <laughs> not quite as much, <laughs> but uh, the driving was still pretty good. Mom was an adventurous person. You would not really know that if you had just talked to her and you know knew her casually. But there was an adventure spirit inside her. I mean, when she married my dad, he just he took a job down in Southern California. They had been up in Idaho, up and packed and moved down away from family and friends and every one thing that she knew to start a new life down there in California with us. And Anything that came up, she would just jump into it, you know. We wanted to go camping, okay, she was on top of that. We, Dad loved to, to ride motorcycles, and uh, we bought a few little small, you know, dirt bikes, and she'd go out riding them with us. Even though it wasn't really her favorite thing, she was there. Because if the family was doing it, she'd do it. Some of my very earliest memories were going to Disneyland and wanting to ride on the bobsleds. That was my favorite ride. And I'm pretty sure that Mom didn't really enjoy riding the bobsleds, but she was there every single time because <laughs> there were four of us and we needed four of us to go on the bobsled, so she was there every single time. Anything that happened, she was there. She did have one last motorcycle ride, however. She, she and my dad were riding up the, the hills, the little road on the hills up above our town in Rolling Heights, and they pulled off a little spot to turn around and they went to go, and she couldn't get her motorcycle to go. We're pretty sure she had her foot on the foot brake and didn't realize it. She couldn't get it to go, kept giving up more gas, more gas. My dad looks behind from the rear view mirror to see her. How could we leave? <laughs> Somehow, she let go of that brake, and that thing, little 
90cc little hunt, a uh, you know, motorcycle, popped a wheelie all the way across the road, turned around halfway back, and crashed in the middle of the road. <laughs> so after that, we referred to her as Crash Hoyer. That was one of her nicknames. <laughs> she got up from that, got back on, kick-started that motorcycle, rode her home behind my dad, and parked it. <laughs> That was enough of that adventure for her. So uh, she decided she'd had enough of that, but uh, she would just jump in and do whatever needed to be done. When we were kids, we had a little VW camper, stick shift, you know, it had to gear down to go up hills. I mean, it really wasn't all that powerful. It had, well, in its later years, a 52 horsepower engine. You go out to buy a car now, you can't even buy anything that's got less than you know, 200 horsepower. That little thing would just chug its way along with a stick shift. Mom could drive that thing everywhere. We took a trip back to Wisconsin to visit family and I don't know how, I was probably around 1970, I think I was maybe nine or 10, something like that. It wouldn't start. One day, we, you know, just like second or third day on the trip, it wouldn't start. And so we push started it, and it ran okay. And my dad called the mechanic, and he said, "Well, I don't know what's going on, but you know, if things get bad, you know, we'll ship a new engine out wherever you are." We push started that EW camper all the way to Wisconsin, you know, all the way back to California. Mike and I and Mom out behind on the bumper, my dad on the side getting it started and jumping in the seat so that he could pop the clutch. Can you imagine doing that these days? We drove out there on Highway 66. There weren't, you know, interstates at the time, so we were going on Highway 66, two-lane highway, push starting that VW camper all the way there and back. <laughs> it turned out it had a crack crankshaft, so the engine would still run fine, but it was just too much for the starter to be able to turn over. But we were the starters. You know, and I think if that happened to us these days, we'd be, you know, in the mechanic shop, we'd say, well, we can't go anywhere, but with mom and dad, you know, whatever needed to be done, we just jumped in and do it. Mom's greatest joy, though, was her family, you know, her children, gosh, whatever needed to be done. She was often the only parent at like and my water polo and swim games and swim te team meets in California. She was often the only parent that showed up for those meets, especially the ones that were away and not being held at our school. And she almost always brought cookies or cupcakes or something, so she was not only our favorite mother, but she was the favorite mother of everybody on the team, too. <laughs> Mom wanted to make certain that my guy knew how to swim, because she didn't. She was not very good at it. She was always afraid of swimming. And she wanted to be sure that we were good at it. <laughs> and we are. And so it was the rest of the family, because that's something that's passed down. That's how Mike met his wife. And uh, Mom just always wanted to be sure that whatever she felt like that she wasn't as good at as she wanted to be, she wanted to be sure that her kids had the chance to do that. Whether it's, you know, cross-country trips, going camping spur of the moment. At one, one time, my very earliest memory of my brothers was going on a little camping trip to a salt and sea. And one of them, I don't remember if it was David or Scott, zipping up my little hoodie. That was a very, very last minute trip. We had a chance to spend the weekend with the boys and Mom just threw everything together and we jumped into our VW camper and took off on a trip because whatever needed to be done, she was able to do it. She invented the rooftop tent. She sewed and designed a canvas tent that would go on the top of that, of that thing. Mike's going to probably tell you a little bit more about that, but she, whatever needed to be done, she could just do it. She sewed that thing on our sewing machine in our house, the canvas tent, and just made it work, and it was perfect. With her grandkids and her kids, quilting was the thing that they probably know grandma for the most, quilting and cooking. She loved to quilt, and she taught me how to quilt. I know how to tie quilts. I'm not really good at stitching of, of fancy quilts. But I have tied a lot of quilts. I even taught my wife how to tie quilts when we first got married. And so that was a love that she passed down. I remember as a kid, there was almost always a quilt set up in our living room. I remember playing underneath it, you know. It was, it was a nice little tent there, you know, on stands in the living room as people were coming by. 
And with the grandkids, she would cook for them, play little games, teach them how to bake banana bread. Caleb and Lily and others are the beneficiary of her showing them how to make banana bread. But I think that what mom really loved the most was just to serve others. She just wanted to be sure that she wasn't a burden and that she was being helpful to others. And I think if I had to say what is her legacy, it would be a legacy of love and service and compassion. And I wanted to share one thing here and a great love with my dad. This is a Mother's Day card that my dad gave to my mom. You know, it says hello to my wife. Things were a whole lot more peaceful in BC before children. But this is more fun, don't you agree? Don't you agree? Happy Mother's Day. She had this sitting on the kitchen table. 1959. This card is all one by them. It's when life was a baby. Dad gave this card to mom. She had it sitting on her kitchen table. That's one of the things that she looked at every single day. Is a legacy of love and happiness and service. That's who my mom is. We'll love her forever and look forward to the time that we could be reunited again. She would be so very, very happy that everyone is here. And, you know, fam, it's a time to have a family reunion. And it's not the, the best reason to have a family reunion, but it's the time that always seemed to happen. And I know that mom is very pleased that we're all here together and loving each other as well as her. And I'm sure going to miss her, but look forward to the times that we'll be together again. The happy memories will live forever. The next thing on the agenda here, the Hoyer Manor singing, uh, Brightly Beams, Our Father's Mercy. There's a story to this, just a slight one. We had been talking about doing this in sacrament meeting. That's, and my mom was really kind of excited about the idea. She said, boy, I really look forward to hearing that. Well, she wasn't able to hear it in sacrament meeting, so we did, gathered all of the men in the family that wanted to participate. And we're going to sing it now so that Grandma can hear it.
Before I go ahead and share a few words with you, we can part a little bit from the program, but I'd like to invite any of the grandchildren that have any thoughts or any memories that they'd like to share, just like um, kind of like Robin shared with her one out of the high crust, the mom, if they have any thoughts or memories that they would like to share, that they're welcome to come forward at this time. Some of my wonderful little memories, but I 
juncture, I was, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity when I was a kid to take a couple trips with Grandma by myself and um, got to go up to Idaho with her because her family was so important and I, to her and she wanted to us to know as much of our family as possible and I was able to do that to meet lots of my second cousins and all just those lovely memories with her eating eating peaches and teaching me how to eat peaches and milk and sugar one of my favorite treats to this day and um, I just love her so much and I love that she loved our family and has shared that with with me and all of us and I love all of you. So, I think we knew Grandma, you know, that her love language was 
was food. She loved to make food and she loved when you ate the food and said how good it was. Um, and so there's a story that she always told that I barely remember it happening, but it's one of my memories kind of off and she told it um, when I was like three or four. They would come over and visit Grandma and Dada. And, and I apparently one morning went to visit them in their bedroom at our house and was hanging out with them. And Dada liked to tease, as you probably also all know. And so he was teasing me about biscuits and gravy because Grandma was asking what I wanted for breakfast. And Dada said, he wants biscuits and gravy because he might not like biscuits and gravy. Uh, and so I got frustrated as a little three-year-old and eventually I said, I don't know how to say that word, biscuits, Dada. Besides, I want pumpkin pie. <laughs> Grandma loved that story. She would tell it over and over and that's one of my favorite memories that I shared with her. But, uh, 
she, uh, she was like, no, these things are no good. But it was just, uh, that particular time stuck with me a lot because I didn't know what was going on. Eggs aren't supposed to be red, they're supposed to be yellow. And uh, she just, she just uh, never stopped. Uh, she just kind of explained what was going on, and I really, really appreciated that. But one more thing uh, that came to mind while I was sitting up here was uh, just recently, a couple months ago, Grandma was working on this really, really difficult puzzle uh, that had a bunch of quilts on it. They were all very similar looking to each other. So Grandma and I, while I was visiting, I probably spent a good five hours or six hours with her on that puzzle. Uh, and we just talked, and uh, that's the only time I've really spent that much time one-on-one on one with Grandma. And uh, I really enjoyed that, and I'm glad that I did. Uh, spend that much time with her because I loved her a lot and we're all going to miss her dearly. Thank you. Um, a couple years ago, my oldest, Jason, was uh, about two um, and he has a lot of energy. And we went over to Ralph Seal's house and we were has the patience of a saint, and she would play with Jason for as long as he was there. She, she wouldn't stop paying attention to him, doing nothing. Like, he would, you know, say, watch this, and proceed to do nothing. And she would clap and applaud and make him feel loved, and it was amazing. Um, but my favorite memory of her in recent years was when we went over, and Jason was in a ball-throwing phase. And she threw that ball for him. They threw it back and forth. And she was not young. And Jason has quite the arm on him and less aim than enthusiasm. And so she, I thought she was going to hit me to the head so often. But she did. She threw this ball with Jason for probably almost an hour with this two year old just back and forth and back and forth. And she would throw it and he would go and get it and throw it back or attempt to throw it back. And she was so patient, and she applauded that kid every time he threw the ball. And he just loved her, and she loved him back. And it was it was amazing to watch the bond between generations. And she she was willing to put in the work to make that happen. It was amazing. I'm not one of the grandkids. But I am, I was affectionately always known as darling daughter. And it was something that Jim had started. It was something that my, that Lucille kept up. And it was something that I was always addressed as, as our darling daughter. And uh, that was, really was a special privilege to have an in-law like that in the in-law department. And uh, to have her in my life for so many years can't begin to go through many of the, any of the memories with her. But I remember when I came up here, apparently on her table, along with the card, was another note. And I wish I had brought it if I had even thought about it, but I'm getting up. But it was a thing that I crocheted made for to my other mother. And she truly was my other mother, especially at a time when my own mother was riddled with disease and pain and she couldn't probably do all the things for me that she wanted to but certainly Lucille was willing to pick up the slack and be that other mother for me. Um, she always had love for everybody. I think one of the things I enjoyed the most sometimes was when the kids were young and they'd go to grandpa and grandma's house. I didn't exist anymore. And I can remember at night time she would make a bed and there would be seven grandkids lined up sleeping in her room every night. I had trouble wanting to do it with one sometimes. But she loved, she'd make a bed and all those grandkids would line up however many were there at the time and always sleep in grandpa and grandma's room. And she had that kind of love, as you all know, and endearment for everybody around her. I'm not sure at this moment if she would like us bragging about her quite so much because she would rather that we be doing and she'd rather that she would be doing and that's the one thing I will take away for sure from her is her selfless act of love 
and of giving and of helping others.
remembers Sheila vividly. She was a very good woman. And I never forgot to, to, say, to, hug, to say goodbye to her and hug her. Her right, Mom and Dad? So, my, 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 uh, my ro most recent and thus last memory you know, of her well, is when, is before, is after I finished yard work earlier than my mom had expected. It, I went in and sat down and talked to her, her, her with, was, which I enjoyed very much. Also, my second to last memory with her, she was very kind, and always gave me $15 dollars. Thank you for yard work, only forgot one time. <laughs> no, I'm not lying. She actually only forgot one time. <laughs> and then, Another time when we were playing Skip Bo when talking and she said that she remembered when Skip Bo came out. She won the game. <laughs> An unrelated note. note. I, I I loved her and and also and whoever sort of put the speak directly into the microphone for inch is from your mouth. I'll miss her.
just left is my brother. Um, we are we have a Moe's we live next door to the Hoyers, and Aunt Lucille is our great aunt. And uh, I was worried. I leaned over to my dad just now, and I was like, I really want to go up there and share something about Aunt Lucille, but I don't know if I should open the floodgates for all the Moe's. Um, Eric did it, so it's not my fault. <laughs> but uh, you know, as a kid, Christmas time is always the best of times for obvious reasons. But the best Christmases were the ones where the players did not go to Texas, where they stayed home, because that man, the seal, was going to be there. They should always be a carrot of banana bread, they should make that little Chex mix with the M&Ms and the pretzels, and, and there was always clam chowder on certain nights, and a big tub of it in the fridge, and you now I'd spend every other hour at the players' house growing up, and having the seal there was wonderful for us, just as it was wonderful for players because she treated us just as lovingly. And uh, I remember I tagged along on some trips with the players often, um, to Grand Canyon or Disneyland, we'd stop in St. George and Disney on the often. And I remember one experience, I was pretty young, maybe seven, and I just I knew to call her Aunt Lucille, but I had no idea what to call her, her husband, because all of the players called him Dada. No, well, that's not his name, and Uncle Jim doesn't sound right, so I call him Uncle Dada. And, <laughs> and Lucille laughs and laughs so hard, and I think she was laughing at me all day. Um, but she, she always expressed so much love that I didn't mind, and I continued to call him Uncle Dada just because it made her smile. Um, we loved her just, just as our own grandmother, and um, we'll miss her.
And she got to the point to where she couldn't be the help that she used to be. And she never wanted to be burdened to anybody, but she always wanted to help. Even to the very last day, as Jeff talked about, when she wanted to go around and hand out a few little tokens of her appreciation for those that have been friendly and kind to her. A couple quick things. Jeff was right when he said that she was kind of ahead of her time in a lot of things. She had no problem calling my father. In fact, uh, we had to correct one little thing that Jeff said um, when she got married to Dad. Made it even more meaningful. When she followed him to California, he did not have a job yet. But she followed him in faith to California. The only thing he had, he had an older sister. His older sister was there. And she went down, they got married in Las Vegas, and moved to California. He went looking for a job. She had full faith. And she was the type of person that, even though she was extremely protective, very conservative what she did, she had the faith to go forward in enough. Um, Oh, what did you, how did you call it? Say it, Jeff, I, I can't think of the right term for it, but she definitely enjoyed um, having a little bit of adventure. Um, didn't want to let that out too much, but she was game for anything. Followed him down there, got a job, got a job, and she made a comment to me one time, she said, yeah, I can't believe what your dad did. He got a job and spent the last money that we had before he got his paycheck on a television set. Um, down there in Southern California. We did have his sister, his oldest sister, who lived down there, so we came close to our country center, and that was good. When they moved to Texas, my father bought into a company called Paragon Distributing. My mother went to her work. My brother alluded to part of the company that they started a second division of the company called Companion Products that did mail order fulfillment for a whole lot of barbecue grills. But this company was a wholesale distributor for barbecues. And the two partners that were there that um, invited him to come down and join them uh, when he was leaving the, the, the manufacturing company that they were kind of shutting things down. And he was looking for a job. They convinced him to come down there and become a part owner in this distributorship. When my mom got there, she saw that they were actually keeping track of inventory on old car stock inventory at all campus. And everything that they do was manually on general ledger. They did not have a computer in the building. Most of it was a typewriter. They were keeping track of that. My mother says, this, we can't live in this age right now, being like this. So she took it upon herself and my dad, when they started this other company, they bought some computer systems, and she got everything going and running on the financial side of it, on the accounting side of it, online, and on the computer. And uh, one of the partner's wives was there, was doing the old way. She didn't trust it, so she kept doing it by the card inventory and taking it out every, every single day, got to track the sales, the inventory, and do financials. And it wasn't for about six months later when she finally realized that everything that my mother had set up and the people that they brought to do it on the computer was every bit as accurate as what she did. She finally gave up on it. My mom was, uh, she was courageous. She had no problems going forward and, and taking the lead on things. Jeff talked about that. We talked camper that she uh, made. We actually had a Volkswagen that was a custom built. Uh, a man, he took an actual Volkswagen um, pickup truck put a top on it and built a camper into the back of it. There was one of a kind. There was never one like it before, never one like it since. You even had a butane tank in it that, um, in the little closet that they built inside of it for a little um, stove that was inside of it. They hinged the front seats to make them into bunk beds, the back and the bottom of it. But they decided we needed a little more room, so my father built, and my mother designed, and so that uh, fold-up tent that sat on top of the camper. We went cross-country and up there in more places than we could imagine. Um, we lift that thing up and um, took the old bunk bed ladder and added extra legs to it to extend it a little so it's up on top. And my dad would get up there, reach inside, pull the ladder on, get up and get inside and pull the thing up. And that's the room. Um, half was slept and the other was inside the vehicle. But there was now we see that they actually, Volkswagen had created a pop top where they had a little bit extra room in it and other vehicles came things, did things like that. But everybody at the campgrounds would come by and they'd see that and they'd pay for it. I don't know what the world it was and where we bought it. My mother sewed that whole tent together, designed it so it fit perfectly. And my dad found the extensions on poles that just folded up and held it perfectly and folded it down and carved over the top of it and took off again and went down the road. Mother was adventurous, but she also was extremely protective of those that she loved. I think her sisters would admit to that. 
very, very protective. Her own, um, Jeff and I will know that. One story about her that she said changed her life. One time when I was very young, we were up in Good Idaho visiting her mom, grandma, and we went to a rodeo, the county rodeo. And they had a little bucking horse out there that, of course, was controlled by the bucking owner there. The buck was upon command and stopped immediately upon command. And they asked for those between a certain age, a young age, to come out there and ride it. And I looked at mom and she said, to me, no, and grandma looked at me and said, no, don't go out there, you might get hurt. I looked over at grandma and grandma says, go. And I took out before my mom could grab me and grandma grabbed my mom's hands and says, Lucille, it's time to let go, let them be, let your boys be your boy. Mom says she always remembered that and that um, changed her life. She was extremely protective. Now, I will say, I was the only one that got out there on that horse. I got, he bucked three times before he bucked me out. I went off the end of it and I landed on my feet and I got a standing ovation from everybody in the stands because I was the only one that landed on my feet and stayed on for three bucks uh, before it stopped. And so I think my mother, at that point, she decided, you know what? I don't have to be as protective, but we can go do things which led her to also do things like the motorcycle trips and everything else that we did, the going cross country. Um, Many times. She always liked to make trees for us. I remember one time when we got the motor home, we got rid of the Volkswagen camper, and we got the motor home. And we went down to Pismo Beach and parked on the beach with all the motorcyclers and all the new and everything going on. And we all thought that was great. My mom thought this was not exactly my type of camping out there on the ocean. And we had water had come up overnight. And a lot of people were stuck in the water, and, um, you know, as the tide came in. And then Nora, thank goodness, um, that we were able to pull right out of it and put the tires on the back. But, but she had made some jello and put it into the refrigerator to set. Well, by the time we got out of there, going through the bumps over the dunes, everything else got on the road, she remembered all of a sudden we went back and looked, and that jello had completely coated the entire inside of the refrigerator. It's like a motor. We had to stop and clean that thing out, and I think it took us a couple trips before we got rid of all the smell and all the color and everything out of there. But, um, She's always making things, as the grandkids mentioned, always loved to bake, always make things, and even making that while we were sitting there camping out at Pismo Beach, we had to get out of there from the day. Um, mother, with who she was, great instead because of her family, but also because of my dad. She had the faith to marry my dad, moved to California, moved away from all her family, which was a hard thing to do. Leaving her sisters and everything else behind, we all assured her that everybody was going to be okay. Because she was kind of the mother hand, wasn't she? You know, at point in love with the grandma, his grandma was working multiple jobs to help and to meet with the family. But I convinced her to go, and she did. My dad was a big part of her life. I want you to know that just a few days before she passed away, she went to the doctor, the doctor checked her heart, and they said her heart is strong, everything's good, everything was fine. Her biggest problem was just her knees would not hold up, she could not walk, could not move very well, she'd fall very easily, as we know. Um, that thus, at the very end, fell. But this is not the first time that um, Mother Lomas had a heart problem. The first time was back when I was in high school, and I was going through some struggles with myself, um, some very difficult um, temptations and struggles um, with the adversary in the church, and going through a few things, and had um, a very difficult time uh, at one point, and I went and talked to my bishop, and the bishop said, you know, the reason these things are happening to you is because it's time number four of your dad to become a member of the church. And the adversary knows that if he knocks you away, regardless of what your brother or your mother does, if, you're, if you leave the church, you probably will not join, but it's time. I want you to go tell your father these things. I went and talked to my dad that night. That was the scariest thing I ever did in my life. I told him some things that happened and told him the bishop wanted to meet with him the next Sunday. I shared with him, and the spirit came over us, and he agreed to go talk to the bishop. Now, the bishop told my mom, and what he did is he says, Jim, it's time for you to become a member of the church. I want you to take your discussions, but we're not going to let Lucille go on because we don't want her to get her hopes up in case something happens and you decide not to do this. So we went to my mother 
And so over, so it's like a little project I have I want to do with your husband, but it means I'm going to have to take him away from you during Sunday school. Is that okay if he's not with you in Sunday school? The mom's here thinking, he's coming to church, he's going to be spending time with the bishop. Yeah, it's okay with me, not a problem at all. This is, that's, a, that's a plus plus. Well, but then we sneak out, and only the bishop and myself and my dad knew at the time. We didn't want anybody else to know in case nothing came up. We didn't want to get the books up. But he took the discussions. My mother caught him one time with a book of mine in the house. Jeff did not know the story. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard it. But caught him with the Book of Mormon. And she says, looked out and find me and says, what's this? And he says, oh, part of this project the bishop has me, has me doing is he wants me to read the Book of Mormon and give, give him a, an opinion of uh, somebody who's not a member of the church give an opinion of what they think about it. So I'm just kind of skimming through it and going to give him my opinion of what I think about it. <laughs> she bought the story with like and said, <laughs> um, he got out of that one. When we knew he became a member, we brought Jeff in. He told Jeff, so he was the only other one that knew. But while we were sitting in the back of the chapel, one Sunday, the bishop said, after we got done with the announcements, he says, Brother Brother, will you please stand? And we were sitting in the very back of the overflow. Um, not the overflow, but in the middle section there. And he stood up and he says, maybe I should call you Mr. Boyer. Many of you may not realize this, but Jim is actually not a member of the church. He's not, even, he's not a member of the church. I think a lot of the members of the board thought he was just inactive because he did a lot of things with us in scouting and youth programs and he was always supportive of us. I mean, even collecting fast office, he throws us around. Funny story on that one, right? It's, it's not that it's funeral, so we won't uh, share some of those. But, um, he says, I would like to invite everybody next Saturday and announce to the board that next Saturday, or next to the Lord and to his wife, that next Saturday Jim will be baptized. My mother went into physical shock. <laughs> President Brown, who was a member of the presidency, who later became a patriarch, and gave him his patriarchal blessing, was sitting on the stand, and she grabbed my hand, and she went limp on the other side. I was on one side of her, my dad was on the other side of her before I came up to prepare the sacrament. I was a senior in high school. And he said he saw her literally the color come out of her face and everything, and she went into physical shock and thought he was going to have to go down and take care of her physically. Thought she was getting up having a heart attack right there. So that was the first time she always had a heart problem. She lived, she said, never wanting to wake up that whole week thinking it may not be true. But as we know, things changed. They had a very, very special relationship. Dad would always leave notes laying around. For mom, we left to go golfing and she wasn't up here, whatever, leave a note. Hey, I love you today, especially toward the end. And she would leave notes for him. And they had an interesting way of eliminating arguments. If they kind of did a little bit of argument, my dad said, wait, wait a minute. Was I within 20 feet of this? Okay, it must be my fault. If it was a really outlandish argument, he said, man, was I within 55 feet or 75 feet of this? Man, it must be my fault. If he thought he was really in the right to say that, they would laugh, argument would be over. Done. I highly recommend that therapy to anybody here, any male or couple. It works very, very well. The other thing that Dad would always say that left an impression upon me and I think upon the grandkids is you come up to my mom and say, Sweetie, have I told you yet today that I love you? Sometimes she says, Yes, you did. She says, Well, I still do. And she says, no, you didn't. He says, well, I have now. But he asked her that on a very, very, very big song every day. He says, have I told you yet today that I love you? I wish that I had carried that a lot better than I am. Or something. I started trying to do that more often. They had a very, very special relationship. Mom wanted everybody to feel included. And we talked about it in Christmas time and in a few comments. We always look like we have four guys underneath the Christmas tree. That's because Grandma wanted to make sure everybody had plenty of things to open. If she had two coloring books, she would wrap up two packages. If she had crayons, they would be in the third package for the kids to open around. There wasn't as much under the trees as it looked, but it always looked like four guys. It would take us till dark to finish Christmas. But that's the way Mom was. She wanted everybody to have to feel included. Mom, I love you very much. You were the rock, the foundation of our family. We had a lot of fun with Dad, we had a lot of fun with you. But you were the solid rock that made everything else work. You were the one everybody gathered around. You were the one that kept everybody together. You were the one that cared for everyone, selfishly, 
selfishly, or selfishly, selflessly, can't get the words to come out. The first one always says stand up to try to clean the dishes, things like that. Delia, you remind me a lot of my mom in that respect. They're always up trying to help do things, and I'm so glad that she went here. Delia is my son in laws mother that came up for the trip, and my mother and her became very close as she lives with my daughter and son in law. She loved you very, very much. And David and Scott, I want you to know she loved you for what it was as if you were her own, because that's the way she was. She told me every time. And I will miss them, but I have a strong impression come over me that after my father passed away, my mother's getting very anxious and really kind of irritable a little bit, trying to get ready to go up to Idaho where he was interred, and we had a week to get up there. And we didn't need to do things quite as quickly. And I said, Mom, relax, stop. And she said, I just can't. I said, Mom, let me give you a blessing. So I gave her a blessing. And in that blessing, very clearly, these were not my words, this is not what I would have thought about. The message came out to me and said, Lucille, be in good cheer. When I called Jim to become a member of the church, he said, he said Lord, here am I. And when I called him to come home, he said, Lord, here am I. So be of good cheer. He's where he needs to be. A very strong impression came over me. That same prayer that I gave her when I thought of mom. And I know that she has her Lord's call at the same time. She wanted to be, never be a burden to anybody, and as her legs were getting to the point to where she couldn't walk very well and it was very difficult, and she felt like she was going to be a burden. It would have been very difficult for her in this life. The Lord came to her and says, It's time. Be with your husband. Be with me. You've done all you can here upon this earth. And she followed and said, Lord, you're mine. And she passed. It's for you, just like my dad did. It would have strongly that was the case. She's left us with a lot of memories, but a lot of foundation to live the rest of our lives. And I thank you all very much for coming today. What a wonderful service for a wonderful woman. Before I share my brief uh, concluding remarks, let me share the rest of the funeral proceedings. After my remarks, we will sing closing hymn number 204, Silent Night. This, the first verses will be sung by the Hoyer family, um, with the congregation joining on the last verse. The benediction will be said by brother, uh, by brother Robert Leong, Lucille's grandson. The graveside services will be held tomorrow in Woodward, Idaho, where Mike Hoyer will be dedicating the grave. After the benediction, I will call the casket bearers forward and then ask you to stand and remain standing while the family exits the chapel. After the casket bearers have escorted the casket outside, that will conclude the service. The casket bearers are Matthew.
The words that kept running and returning to my mind were from the hymn, families can be together forever. I have a family here on earth. They are so good to me. I want to share my life with them through all eternity. Families can be together forever through Heavenly Father's plan. I always want to be with my own family, and the Lord has shown me how I can. As she leaves this family temporarily behind, I just want to share with you that, as has been said, there's a reunion. She's meeting just as big and even larger of a family and uh, reunion where she is now. Second thought, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all that all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And my third and final thought, the poem from Henry Wordsworth Longfellow. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, and dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate. Still achieving, still pursuing. Learn to labor and not to wait. I want to testify to you. Through the atonement of Christ, through his resurrection and his love for us, we're all going to rise again, including Sister Lucille Boyer and we love the Boyer family. And leave you with the hope and testimony of a resurrection and a reunification to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ.
dear my own father. I'm so grateful today for all the families and friends who have gathered together to celebrate the, the life of uh, this year. We are grateful for our wonderful life as a disciple of Christ. For the, the example that she was and for all the life that she has touched. My breath will form for the love she had for each one of us and for the legacy that she is leaving for our descendants. Casket bearers, please come forward as has been instructed by the funeral director. And will the congregation please stand and remain standing as the family exits the chapel? Amen. 